Hello and welcome to another episode of Oh So Curious. Good to be back on the show. I'm having a good hair day, which is great to to have. Um, always appreciated. Uh, thank thanks to myself. And uh, on today's show, we're we're talking about a few different things, as, as per usual. Um, and uh, that will include things like you know Netflix. They finally put out numbers. They decided to come clean. They were like, you know what? We'll let the people know what shows are actually popular and what shows are not popular. There's a bit of a caveat to the numbers, though, but we, and we'll discuss that. Apparently, Disney Plus and Hulu finally made a decision to combine themselves into one app, which, you know, if you're in the know with the industry, you know, it's, it's a long time coming. But uh, otherwise, if you are just a, you know, normal person and you weren't following the story, we'll give you some context. Um, and we look ahead to Wonka. That's, that's going to be the first of three Warner Brothers movies coming out this month. They're set to dominate the box office, you know, as a studio. A lot of the other studios have pulled their movies from the slate this year um, or, you know, the holiday season because of uh, strikes and other reasons. So Warner Brothers gets to basically have a free run uh, at the box office. And we'll have a couple other things like Marvel, DC stuff. We always talk about those. And to talk about all of those things and so much more today, I've got with me Angelina. How are you doing today? I'm good. Unfortunately, my hair doesn't look as good as yours does today, but you know, it's fine. When you make the decision to get bangs, you kind of just can never go back. You know, it just is the worst. Yeah, just moving on. Don't get bangs. That's how I feel about that. Um, but other than that, we're doing good. Nice. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be getting bangs anytime soon. I don't I don't know if that's quite my style. So mm, I don't know. Um, it we'll... could be it could be a very interesting Dan move. That that would be something. You know, maybe I should. Maybe I'll try that for like next Halloween. Like I'll I'll get like a wig. Just get like a headpiece. You can just get clip-ins. You don't even need a, a wig. Just get clip-ins, and then you've I could got do that. little. I could try it. Yeah, that's what I should have done. But you live and you learn. Yeah. Well, um, you know who's who's uh, not getting clipped. Sorry, that's a bad transition. We'll just skip forward, and uh, we'll start talking about Netflix. I was I was going to say something that I would have probably regretted. So um, Netflix, for the first time ever, has put out some viewership numbers that we haven't quite seen before. Like we we always have like the top 10 charts. Like you can you can see what's in the top 10 in the U.S. You can see what's in the top 10 in the U.K. You can whichever ge you know, geography you're in, you can check the worldwide top 10, stuff like that. The, the weekly charts, you can go to Netflix as public information. They tell you which shows are doing, which movies are doing the best. But now for the first time ever, they've done something that we, we it's hard to kind of see, like, well, I, I think there's a bit of a coincidence why they put this out now. Because recently we had the SAG after a strike, the WGA strike, and basically in those strikes, every, you know, they were looking for more transparency from especially the streamers. Like, hey, we used to get like, you know, pretty clear cut ratings numbers from like Nielsen and other report, reporting methods for broadcast television, we still do. But what about the streaming services? Are we gonna mm -hmm. get the numbers for how well our show is performing? Because that's what residuals are based off of. And now that we live in a streaming first world, how do we make that work? And and you know, the, the two unions, the actors union and the writers union, they came to a deal to do what they call essentially is a performance bonus for shows that perform beyond a certain threshold in terms of viewership on streaming. And then, you know, the actors and the writers will get a certain bonus on top of their uh, original compensation package that they got when they initially signed on and did the work on the project. And those numbers, the viewership numbers, we're finally starting to get an idea of, of what, what, what maybe those are, I said, at least from Netflix's side. So, Angelina, you looked at this article, and I'm going to put it mm -hmm. up on screen for our viewers. This is something that I first read in Deadline, but it's all over the news. I actually just put up the wrong article. Let me switch over to the Netflix one. Um, we are going to talk about Hulu later, so I'll, I'll bring that up later. But basically, Netflix, you know, put out this report, and this is something they put out on their own blog, like on their own website. And as part of that, they they put up like a PDF file, which has literally, like, no joke, got like thousands of titles mm -hmm. in the order of you know, like how many hours did people watch uh, of the, of that show or movie. So you, I'm, I'm sure you look through some of this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to digest. Yeah, it's a lot. Hey, what do you think about like Netflix putting these numbers out? And then B, well, what know, do you think about my theory that is connected to the strikes and like the change in reporting that was required oh, from those deals? 
100%. I think there's no other reason they would have ever taken the time. They released like a legitimate like six page excel document which i don't know if i've ever seen i don't know if i've ever seen a media company ever do that before that was super interesting to get like you literally have to download the excel sheet to like scroll through it very strange they were like we're not even doing graphics this is coming straight from our straight from our information and i do not think that they would take the time to do that if they were not forced to do that and it brings up a really good question of like, obviously the SAG strike deal was just ratified. I think Netflix has now been pressured to ultimately be super transparent. I don't think they have any other options. Netflix has been one of the primary sort of antagonists in the SAG strike situation. It was Disney, it was Netflix, and... um what was the other the, one of the other top three big entertainment companies that like did not I was want on Prime. to come? Yes. Yeah. And so all three of these entertainment streaming services have been the opposite of transparent for years about their numbers, about viewership, like where are they getting these numbers? How are they calculating things? And so I feel like Netflix just felt like the only way to just get ahead of it at this point is to release this. They've only released it from January to June, despite it being December, which is interesting. And they're not going to do, um, they're going to do it twice a year. They're going to release all of the streaming data, et cetera, um, and all the numbers twice a year. So we get to see exactly what Netflix is, uh, what numbers they're pulling. Yeah. And, and so there's a reason why they released this only from like January to June, because Apparently the metric that they were using to, to measure viewership and the top 10 charts mm -hmm. uh, was different because they were just measuring the total number of hours viewed. So when you think about that, like if you have a movie that's 90 minutes, that's the one and a half hours. If a hundred people watch it, that's like 150 hours, like rough math. If you have like a TV show that has nine episodes and let's just say round them up to like an hour, even per episode, you had nine hours. If 100 people watch the whole show, that's 100 times 9 is 900 hours. So one season of a show could have 900 hours of watch time and be way higher than a movie that had the same amount of viewers mm -hmm. because it was like only 150 minutes. Yeah. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a way less. So, or like 90 minutes, I should say. That's the math, right? Um, but the point being that metric favored the longer runtime rather than favoring you know, the thing that actually performed the best. So yeah. it's starting in June, Netflix switched this metric. And I have a feeling this has something to do with, again, the strikes, because this new metric that they use now, which is not just them, but a lot of the other streamers as well, especially now that they have a deal in place with the unions to use the same metric, that new number is generated by taking the total number of hours viewed on any title, and then dividing it by the runtime of that title. So for a show, it would be the entire runtime of a season, or for a movie, the entire runtime of a movie. So you divide the total number of hours viewed by that number, and then you get a number for that show or movie. Those figures we don't have yet because they mm -hmm. started measuring them in June. So I'm sure that when the next six month report comes out in 2024, for June different. to December, that's yeah. when these num those numbers will come in. So to to clarify the numbers that we just got from January to June, those, if you look at the spreadsheet, I kind of took the top 25 and put them in a different document that I've got on screen, where you see like the Night Agent season one, which I believe had like eight or 10 episodes, might've had 13, I don't know. Like mm -hmm. I watched the show, I binged it in three days. I forgot how many episodes there were. Good show, looking forward to season two. But that show had 812 million, 100,000 hours viewed. That's a Crazy. really big number. Yeah. And you look at the second on the list, Ginny and Georgia season two, it's got Which like 665 million. Big fan. <laughs> it's, it's a great, it's it a, I've a heard it's a show. great show. Um, you know, and yeah. what's really interesting though, is I wonder how many people, because technically Netflix doesn't have to start. I mean, nobody has to start paying out the bonuses until starting January, right? It's like I a believe, yeah, the deal doesn't kick in until a certain 
I don't know the I remember the exact date, but it doesn't it didn't kick in exactly. Can you imagine a- being on these shows in the past year that were top tier, getting paid base level salaries, and then they're gonna see these numbers and they're gonna be like, for reals? Like I'm just wondering the level of outrage that is going to break out. Yeah. Well, the thing is though, that was always gonna be the case considering yeah. that. You know, there was always going to be a period. Like, for example, if you were on the show Suits, which is doing bonkers numbers on Netflix, and the show went off the air like five years ago, none of those, like, even today, that show doesn't qualify under the New Deal because the show yeah. is not a streaming original. It's not being released today. And, but here's the thing though Suits probably had a deal from its production company for the actors that whenever it goes on reruns, they were going to get residuals based on like their broadcast contract. Mm-hmm. So trust me, this people who worked on suits, they're taken care of with like the traditional, biz- you know, model of television. I mean, one of those residuals. main, main cast members is now like one of the queens of England or something. She a queen oh, or no, 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 she's a princess. Or something. I don't know if Duchess. That, well, if they gave up their official titles because they're not mm-hmm. quite you know, like doing all the work of the But she's royal still family. like royalty though. She is, yes. Yeah. yeah I'm I'm she's she's she doesn't have and she doesn't have money problems. Like no we're speaking she's of not... Meghan Markle, everyone. Right. I don't know. Yeah. It kind of sounded like they were having money problems. It's always uh, funny how the richest of the rich have the most money problems. Yeah, it's like you it's know, people are like spending too much money at the top. Right. But also like I think like money problems is a relative term. It's like when yeah, Sydney Sweeney true. buys like a mil- multi-million dollar house and says I can't make I'm like sell the house and like you I'm sure you can live in a smaller house like you know like whereas somebody <laughs> like, else's money problem sucks. might be yeah. my bank account is overdrafted like that's a very different kind of problem yeah. and I can't pay the mortgage on my 100 million dollar house I don't know it's like whatever. yeah I totally but I there with the, you the one thing about this report that I noticed, so if you look at the the, the list that I put together in, in, in what I'm calling the notebook that we have in, in-house, and it's just like a good way to demonstrate the top 25 from the mm-hmm. list, because the list that Netflix put out has like so literally, long, like I said, guys, like long pages, yeah, like long tens of thousands of <laughs> or several yeah. thousand at least Insane. You know, yes. pieces. When we look at like even the, just the top 10, like the majority of these are TV shows. Mm-hmm. And again, we talked about earlier that this metric that they're using here, just hours view, definitely favors a TV show because you have more runtime. You know, if you're going to watch a whole season, you're going to watch way more hours of, of that program than you're going to watch a movie. So when you look at the top 10, because for example, like Extraction 2 was huge on, yeah. on Netflix, right? Like that sequel with with uh, Thor, Chris Hemsworth. Extraction 2 is like number 21 or 22 or something like that. It's in the 20s. That's like the, I think that's even the first, that might even be like the first movie that's on this list. The Mother is the first one in its one, yep. like 12 or 13. But even that is like not in the top 10. So yeah, you no. look at like how, again, like you have to there's go in really much further down and everything else is a TV show. In fact, yeah. there's a couple of TV shows in here that don't even, they don't even have global distribution. If you look at the original spreadsheet in the top 10, there is a show called Lorena del Sur, which I can only imagine is a Spanish TV show. And it's season three lives on, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it's like number seven on the list. And it's not even available globally, meaning it's not available in all the Netflix markets. Yeah. The vast majority of the titles in the, in the high, you know, 25 and 30s, the top 50 are. But there are some examples where it may be the biggest hit in these markets that it's in. Mm-hmm. And it's enough to put it up there. Having said that, I do want to clarify something that um, we were touching upon earlier. This new metric where they're going to, you know, divide the total hours viewed, which is the only metric we have currently got in, in, in the report that we do have, they're going to then take those hours viewed and divide it by the runtime of the thing, of the program or the movie. So like if extraction was two which hours. Which should allow for just like a, a general, yeah. in general, just more fairness overall. Because exactly. the, the previous metric just didn't make sense. Yeah, because this hours view doesn't exactly tell you how many viewers it got. And yeah. and I know that that's different from like, for example, on YouTube, right? Like we live on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube and you see the number of views on a video, just looking at the number of views doesn't tell you how long somebody watched that video for. Mm-hmm. Like it will count it as a view if they watch it for five seconds or for 20 minutes. 
like I think there's a certain lower or low end threshold on it. And mm -hmm. YouTube has ways to kind of figure out if you're spamming a video, but it's still at the same time, it doesn't tell you how long somebody watched it. So I think Netflix, Netflix and streaming services, they go by minutes or hours watched. Like, so they just go, like, they don't care about how many unique viewers they got. They just see like how often people watched it. And yeah. the other thing Ted Sarando said is that each show and movie has like a different, like the economics work differently for each of these things, right? So the night agent had a budget per episode that was different from the total budget of extraction. And when you do like a per minute basis, like the movie may have been much more costly on a permanent basis than the TV show. So each TV show doesn't need to do the same kind of numbers to be considered successful. It just depends on mm -hmm. how much money they spent on the show. And so the success is going to be relative. Like your show may be like number 500, but for the budget that and the, or the amount of money certainly Netflix put into it, whether they acquired it, they partly funded it or they entirely funded it, it may be enough to keep it going. Or it may be sitting in the top 10, but because it's so ridiculously expensive that even that number is not good enough to keep yeah. it going. So there will be examples like that. Like, you know, The Sandman was a show ridiculously expensive to make, an adaptation of a DC comic. And that show, we may not get a season two, even though season one was yeah. wildly successful because of how expensive it was. Mm -hmm. Like, it would have just have to break all kinds of records to even, like, give Netflix an opportunity to say, yes, it's worth keeping this going. So yeah, the biggest thing about this news to me is that we are getting some transparency from Netflix and at a level that we have never gone before. And the biggest thing out, uh, outside of that that interests me is the next report we're going to get in 2024, because that report is going to give us, you know, the metric that is actually now mandated that the streamers report because mm -hmm. that's what the bonuses for actors and writers are going to be based on. And so I'm also interested in seeing what, whether other streaming service providers, you know, whether it's Prime, Hulu, which soon is going to be Disney Plus, Hulu together, or even like Max, like Paramount Plus, Peacock, all of these other services, are they going to start putting out these reports? Because that kind of transparency would surely be great for, you know, people to also, I'm sure most people don't care about like every like thing on the list, but I'm sure they'll like get a kick out of seeing the thing that they enjoyed the most at the top of the list. So yeah. I mean, what do you think? Are you no, I mean, I'm excited report? about the transparency. I'm excited about all of it. I, overall, I think it is looking to a brighter future because I'm excited now with Netflix doing this, other streaming services are going to be forced to do this. And I also think it's a really good way to see, you know, your show that you love, like it, you're going to know sooner rather than later, like how it's doing. I feel like, Netflix right now doesn't have to answer to anybody like they just they're canceling shows that are getting Emmy nominations, which is like, why? So it, at least with this sort of transparency, you're going to be able to track sort of and see even just for ourselves, not only like the actors working in it, how the show is doing, but we ourselves are going to be able to sort of track how shows are doing, what's going into it. Maybe I love the show. It got an Emmy nom, but maybe not enough people did love the show. You never know. So I definitely think transparency is key here. You know, I think the Nielsen ratings and sort of reproducing something similar to that is necessary in these industries. Absolutely. And while there are, you know, Nielsen ratings for streaming shows and stuff, they usually are like behind, like they, you, yeah. you get the numbers for four weeks ago each time they release a new set of numbers. So they don't quite keep up at the same pace because it takes longer for that to be calculated. Mm -hmm. There's other things like Samba, which is like another, met a lot of TVs come with that integrated. So they will kind of monitor what you're watching and then report it. So every once in a while, we get a report mm -hmm. from them saying this show like broke some kind of record. So there's other means for studios and streamers to measure this stuff, but the numbers they have in the house are the most accurate because they literally can track mm -hmm. all of our, you know, user, user trends and viewership trends. So I'm excited to see some more transparency for not just the people who are working on these shows and movies, but also for the general audiences, because I think it, at the end of the day, it gives everybody a chance. I'm nobody's going to, not everybody's going to go into this blog post and read the whole PDF or the whole mm -hmm. Excel file, but it, it just gives you the opportunity to have the data out there so you can see for yourself how well, you know, something like the night agent did, mm -hmm. which apparently was really, really well. So guys, let us know in the comments below. Did you, did you look at this report and say like, oh my God, Queen Charlotte, 
I knew it was big. I didn't know it was that big. Or like Ginny and Georgia deserves to be number two. Can't wait for Night Agent season two or Extraction two. Like I'm surprised not as many people watched it as I thought they did, but you know, still out there. So let us know in the comments what you think about this. What do you think about the, the future of streaming reporting? If you work in the industry, I'm sure you're looking forward to seeing more of these numbers come out and, and have the transparency because I'm sure it's going to affect how what your earning potential is. So let us know in the comments below what you think. Like and subscribe for more content like this. I'm sure when the next report comes out, we'll talk about it then as well. And of course, keep checking back here and also curious for more news and other topics like this as well. So it's coming up on around three years since um, initially Disney, you know, bought Fox. And as part of that acquisition of Fox, Disney got the 33% ownership of Hulu that Fox used to have. Disney already had 33% before. So when you combine 33 plus 33, all of a sudden Disney was the majority shareholder in Hulu. Mm -hmm. And now that left one other shareholder still, you know, sitting around holding the other 33% which was uh, NBC Universal, aka Comcast. Now, they decided when this deal happened a few years ago that around, you know, late 2023, there was going to be a clause that was going to kick in where NBC could basically force Disney to purchase, you know, that leftover stake that they had in Hulu. So that time came. The two companies, NBC Universal, Disney, they, they went ahead and they said, okay, we're going to hire our own law firms. Let's get a value on how much we think Hulu is worth. Then they kind of compromised on the number they could both agree on. And they ended up, you know, making the sale. Disney ended up, you know, spending a few billion dollars that I'm sure they, you know, they thought was worth it buying the rest of Hulu that they didn't have ownership of. Now, they've already been in charge of programming all of Hulu. So for the vast majority of the content that lives on Hulu today is owned by Disney, whether it's through the legacy Disney properties or the ones they acquired through Fox. So now that Disney owns all of Hulu, something this is something that I think Bob Iger has hinted at in the past, both before he retired and then since he has returned. Uh, and even Bob Chapek, I think, has hinted, hinted at it while he was still around. And that was that over time, Disney's goal was be, to take Hulu and combine it with Disney Plus in some form or manner, right? Now, internationally, if you are not in the U.S. and you want to watch, um, you know, anything that's on Hulu in the U.S., you generally will find it in the Disney Plus app anyway. And it's part of like their, they have got this like little uh, section called Star, which is Star is a brand that, you know, generally known outside of North America and especially in in parts of Asia. And so when, and it was used to be part of Fox. So like when Disney Plus came out, they were like, we got a bunch of this content in the US and Canada, we've got Hulu. So we'll keep it separate because it doesn't quite line up with, mm -hmm. you know, our brand of content that Disney's known for family friendly stuff. Like American Horror Story, you wouldn't put on Disney Plus because that's not necessarily, you know, house of mouse material, you know, at least not in, it's even though corporately it's all owned by the same people. So they put it on Hulu internationally. It was under the star banner. Now that Disney owns all of Hulu, they decided, you know what, let's do, let's do it. Let's do the merger. So that's what's happened. Like now, if you go on Disney plus you have a subscription, I'm sure you noticed recently when you logged in, there's a little Hulu thing that sits, you know, right next to, I believe national geographic. Mm -hmm. So, so we recently saw this article. I saw this article online. And then I was like, hey, Angelina, we should talk about this because this is very interesting. So let me put it on screen. And, and apparently there's a report out now from Ampere Analysis where they said, now that Disney Plus and Hulu are set to become like one app and you're going to be able to, you know, just go to the Hulu section of Disney Plus app to watch anything that was previously on the separate application, such as Only Murders in the Building, American Horror Story, The X-Files, any of the other stuff that, you know, you wouldn't, you would have to go to Hulu before. Um, apparently it's going to, you know, let Disney plus the new upgraded Disney plus app, once it's combined with Hulu, it's going to allow Disney plus to become like even better than Netflix in many ways. And the metric mm -hmm. that this article talking is talking about is yes, Netflix has like twice as many titles as Disney plus does, even with this combined app, they're going to have like just under 10,000 titles, but Netflix has like close to 20,000 titles, like twice as many. 
And by the way, the majority of these near 10,000 titles are coming, like over 7,000 of them are coming from Hulu. So Disney Plus's library itself, many people have complained. There's not a ton to watch beyond, you know, Star Wars and and Marvel, which is true. Um, but now with Hulu being added, they're going to have a lot more. They're going to quantuple mm-hmm. almost their library, but still have only about half as many titles as Netflix does. However, what helps them kind of level the playing field is stuff like Star Wars, is stuff like Only Murders in the Building, and Emmy award-winning TV shows, as well as, of course, the tons of award-winning stuff that FX puts out every year. And of course, you still have Star Wars, you have Pixar, you have all the usual suspects that Disney Plus already had. And it's going to allow Disney Plus to have a, you know the more popular of the shows and movies when you look at the overall streaming landscape. Even though Netflix has the quantity, it seems like Disney Plus will have, you know, the maybe not necessarily the quality, but certainly the popularity on its mm-hmm. side. So Angelina, what do you think about this? I mean, how much of a difference do you think is going to make for a subscriber, which by the way, a lot of people who already yeah. have Hulu have Disney Plus and vice versa because of the bundle. Yeah, deal I think offer. it's 44% so, currently of US Hulu yeah. subscribers already have access to Disney Plus because previous, like even when they were three quarters owners of hulu they had already had like an option to bundle i remember i got the option to bundle years ago i i want to say like two three years ago when it first happened um they offered the opportunity to bundle because i used to get hulu for free through my like t-mobile yeah bill or something Maybe they think horizon and like a bunch at&t like yeah. they have had deals yeah, yeah. yes so I feel like that ended when Disney bought out, but I'm not sure. I, it could be wrong. I can't really remember at this point. It's it's been a while. It's too many streaming, too many streaming services to own. Um, but I do think that this will just be a huge advantage because now I don't have to own Disney Plus and Hulu. I can just own both, or I can own one and have access to all of it. I don't need both apps. Place. I don't need both apps on my computer. I just go to one app and I get to see it. So Yeah, and and that's a big deal because to me like I I actually probably watch more stuff on Hulu than I watch on Disney Plus because like yeah, on Disney Plus you've got the normal Marvel stuff and the Star Wars stuff. Like you want to watch like anything that's not that. Because I that past those titles Disney Plus doesn't have a ton else that a lot of people like unless you're like a you know, like a you're a big fan of like all the Disney channel shows and stuff, which, you know, every once in a while I do that. But beyond that, you go to Hulu and like even like the Echo show that's coming out, you know, next year, which is part of the MCU, it's going to be releasing on Hulu. But I guess now it's going to be on, you know, the, the new combined mm-hmm. app, but it was set to be released on Hulu because it was going to be gory and it's going to have a TVMA rating. So, yeah. you know, not your average Marvel fair. And then, of course, Star Wars in general, like, doesn't quite go in that direction either, unless you're, like, Andor, which, you know, exception. But I guess now we're going to see more of that. Small segue, I finally watched, uh, I finally watched Thor Love and Thunder, and it's probably the worst. I turned it off. It's that bad. Yeah, it's not, it it leaves a, like, I liked it in the beginning when I walked out of the theater, but I thought about it. Why is it it so hokey? Sorry, this is my cat, everybody. She's (laughs) making her appearance today. Um it's so bad it's so bad yeah that was a really bad segue sorry but the other segue is hulu is popping off with some of the best titles right now um if you haven't watched murder at the end of the world yet you have to i wait around every single day like every monday i wait for it to be released at 9 p.m um because it's that good and so i just think the disney plus and hulu merger is the full full merger we should call it is honestly kind of awesome it's kind of awesome when you have huge companies like apple plus and netflix and amazon that own like everything it's kind of nice that the the smaller guys are yeah it's funny to call disney the smaller guy but in comparison yeah and in terms of pure sizes like Mm -hmm. yes apple and Amazon dwarf Disney in terms of their yeah. you know, company's values on Wall Street. But as far as like, I think presence in the world of entertainment, Disney, you know, probably has, yeah, I always get distracted when <laughs> you have the cat on screen. <laughs> but yeah, Disney's like, market, 
as necessarily huge. Like, you know, like, and that's really the point of what this article is, is, is saying is the fact that you get Disney Plus and Hulu together and now you have not just Star Wars and Marvel and mm-hmm. Pixar. Now you get like only murders in the building. You get everything that FX yeah. is putting. You get the Simpsons, which Simpsons were also already on there, but there was there were other Fox comedies, traditional like in animation. Some of those would not be on Disney Plus because they were like, yeah, not quite Disney yeah. Plus friendly. They are going to remove like three hundred titles, but overall, they're still going to have way more popular titles than any of the other streaming services. And also, you have to think about the fact that Hulu also has so many shows that first air on TV still, and then they'll air after the TV release on Hulu. And I can only suspect that a lot of those titles will stay on like that. I'm sure they'll still license several shows uh, to be released like that. But like, I remember, I haven't, I haven't had cable for a really long time. And so for a while, I really missed out on getting to see some big cable. Are you staring at the cat? I am, yes. I can see Dan staring at my cats. Hemi, you're distracting us. Um, So for a while, like, I was really missing out on some of these big titles that hadn't hit streaming, were still airing on live TV, and Hulu sort of helped bridge that gap for a long time where it'll, you know, it'll premiere on TV that night, and then immediately after that release, it would release on Hulu. So I was able to see all sorts of fun titles, that we're still live on TV, and I can only assume that they're going to continue on with that. Um, most notably, I feel like Good Girls, they did that with, I mean, but they do that with so many TV shows. So it'll just be a nice sort of all-in-one package. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I definitely think you, you'll still see a lot of that. I do know, just based on this article that I was reading in, in Deadline, that there's a lot of um, titles that and that NBC Universal Comcast owned which now that they're no longer a part owner of the mm-hmm. streaming service, they will be coming off Hulu because of course, you know, Comcast has its yeah. own streaming service in Peacock. So they're probably just going to put a lot of those shows on there. I've already seen like some of the new shows that have sort of debuted in the era since Disney became the majority owner of Hulu and also then, you know, basically being in charge of all the programming work there. So basically Comcast has just kind of sat there with a stake and really no say in what Hulu is as a as a as a service and not how the app looks and all that stuff that was all has all been disney for a few years so now uh, there, if you want to see a show that aired on tv that has started in the time since disney became the majority owner of hulu that show is more likely to be available the next day on peacock mm-hmm. rather than on hulu so maybe there was already some, I think they were already transitioning away. Yeah. But now I think we're only further going in that direction where Comcast is pulling its programming out. Fair enough. You know, they just, they, they got a really few billion dollars know, for it. Out of, out of our subscribers and people that watch, I was so curious, how many of you actually subscribe or have a Peacock subscription? What is premiering on Peacock that I really want to watch? Like... Friday Night at Freddy's does not count. It does not count. There, there's a new Ted show. It's like a prequel. Like with, so you're not gonna get Mark Wahlberg, but you're gonna get like a younger version of the character. A younger Ted. version of Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, Seth, Seth MacFarlane is uh, apparently a creator. So that's a mini series. They've got they had the Continental show, which apparently was not very good. Oh, uh, from we the world were of John Wick. To watch that, weren't we? So sad. Yeah, I I Thank saw the reviews you. and I was like, eh, maybe I'll get to it. But yeah. and I saw the trailers and and quite frankly, I just I think they went a little for a franchise like John Wick. I was like, how could you be so hokey? Like I know that John Wick kind of straddles the line, mm-hmm. but I, maybe it's just the fact that Keanu Reeves is so understated in his performance because it's not like the John Wick scripts are like the most well written yeah. things ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very simple concepts. I just think the actors that they have, especially Keanu Reeves being the lead, like they pull it off. Whereas mm-hmm. it seems like the TV show just couldn't do it. They had the new Twisted Metal show that was on there. I think Anthony Mackie was in Not it. Any few... But but like overall, Peacock is in a service that is 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 like in most people's top three. Yeah. Like most people are like Netflix, Disney Plus, Max, maybe or like Paramount Plus if you're mm-hmm. into the whole 
um, you know, uh, what's the what's the the Yellowstone universe of Yellowstone. shows, or if you yeah. love Taylor Sheridan and anything he does. Um, but yeah, I think Peacock will all of a sudden get a bunch of programming, and Hulu um, is joining, you know, uh, the Disney Plus universe. Yeah. So it's exciting to see the change because from a user standpoint, we're gonna finally get something that's a little more unified. You like you said, like one yeah. app one less set of one less password you have to remember one less password you might want to share with friends and family which i think disney plus is mm -hmm. trying to you know clamp down on anyway uh trying guys, to pull a netflix the... yeah yeah well, i will no, never forget when i eventually. logged into netflix and it was like your ip address is not correct and i was like <laughs> now i have yeah, to for my own netflix it's going to happen because I think every streaming service, like they put it in a policy. You're not supposed to sh be sharing yeah. your password. It's just, they haven't reinforced it. And I guess now they're going to start doing it, but guys, let us know in the comments below. What do you think about this idea that with Disney plus and Hulu becoming one, they will have the more popular overall of the titles compared to Netflix, even though Netflix has twice as many titles in their library, it looks like Disney plus is going to have the more popular of the ones in total, including like FX, Murders and Only Murder, Murders in the Building, American Horror Story, and I'm sure a lot of legacy stuff. Like, you know, I recently saw Elf was on Hulu. I was like, yay, it's Christmas time. I got to do my customary, mm -hmm. you know, watching, viewing of Elf once a year. So let us know in the comments. What do you think, guys? And, and of course, you know, like, subscribe for more content like this. I'm sure when the app launches in March, we'll have more news. And there's, of course, a bunch of new content that they're likely to release each and every month. And now it's all going to be in one app. I'm looking forward to Echo. Let's see how that looks. We'll probably review that here. So keep coming back here for more updates about that and so much more. All right. On today's episode of DCU Daily, we're going to talk about something that both I think is good news, but at the same time, I think, you know, there's people on the internet who are like calling out James Gunn for yet again, nepotism, which honestly, I love Sean Gunn in anything. Like I've loved him since Gilmore Girls. I loved him in all the Guardians movies. I can't wait to see more of him in the DCU. And that's exactly what it looks like we're going to get because there's a recent report out from Deadline and the, the, apparently they got a scoop and so they broke it and they were like, look, it, it, Sean Gunn, J brother of James Gunn, which is not, you know, I'm not saying that's the only reason we know who Sean Gunn is. He himself has a very impressive resume, but it looks like Sean Gunn is going to be playing Maxwell Lord in the DCU. Now, Angelina, mm -hmm. if you remember... A few years ago, we got a movie from DC called Wonder Woman 1984, the second movie in that franchise. Yeah, that was and, good times. You know, Peter Pascal, America's Daddy, he was America's Maxwell Daddy. Lord in that movie. So having you know, having seen that iteration of the character, now it looks like we're gonna be going in a different direction because the DCEU is on its way out and the DCU is on its way in. So as part of that, we're gonna be recasting that character. And James Gunn has, of course, you know, it looks like selected Sean Gunn, his brother, to come in and take over the role. I really don't care about, like, whether Sean Gunn is related to James Gunn or not. I mean, you told me before the show, you didn't even realize it until recently that they were related. Yeah, I, so, I know that sounds so stupid because they have the same last name, but it really didn't even yeah. click. I was like, are they cousins or something? Like, I don't think they look that much alike, <laughs> but no, brothers, there you go. Yeah, but what, do, what did you think about this news? Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think especially as they're looking to recast Pedro Pascal in the MCU, I do think it makes sense sort of moving away from him in the DCU. Am I sad to see America's Daddy lose out on any work opportunities? Of course, he could have played both sides. I would have loved that. Um, who says he can't still do it? That's I, I'd true. I'd venture a guess that's he may true. still be a different character. The, I, I do think that Sean Gunn is maybe an interesting choice for this character. I, you know, especially it sort of hint, seems like James Gunn was hinting with one of the original writers of the comics that they're going for this sort of complicated character. He's not necessarily like, he's definitely an antagonist, but he's not necessarily evil. He's got a heart of gold. I don't know if Sean Gunn it's, gives me so, that. John, Sean Gunn has always been kind of kooky. Like in Gilmore Girls, yeah. he's kooky. His character in Guardians of the Galaxy, kooky. That's the word that comes to mind when I think of his face, of his acting style. He's just kind of like the comedic relief so often. And 
does that say that he cannot play something more complicated? No. But I don't necessarily know if he was, like, the right... The right move for it? But with that being said, like, sure, dude. Like, I don't... I don't think this role is going to be, like, a huge part of the new DCEU, so... Yeah, like, the so the post that I think you re referred to is James Gunn, you know, on threads, and I'm sure, I think on Twitter, too, he he posted it. I don't know if they were having a conversation back and forth, but uh, J.M. DeMatisse, who is one of the creators of the, the 1987 iteration of the Justice League comics, that's when Maxwell Lord was first introduced as a character, and then it had a long running arc well into like the, the late 80s, where he initially starts off as like a, a good person. Like, he uh, you know, he's helping the Justice League come together. He's key to the Justice League International being put together. He's helping them with their mission and blah, blah, blah. He's like a billion billionaire. And eventually we find out, though, he's working with like like some e some some kind of evil force. I forget the exact nature of how the It's like story an evil turns. computer or something that was... Yeah. yeah, and then he's basically helping put robots in charge of like governments around the world like that's his evil mm -hmm. plot so on the surface he's a good guy but really truly he isn't mm -hmm. and so i think james gonna kind of almost maybe playfully was referring to you know in that conversation with you know the one of the creators of this the comics one of the creators of the character of maxwell lord that he sees the character as more of an anta antagonist than mm -hmm. a straight up villain which I, I i'm like you know what that's a better way to probably approach it because a lot of what people like were criticizing Pedro Pascal's version of the character for not necessarily because I mean like Pedro Pascal has all the charisma in the world and I think he made the most of what he was given in that movie in Wonder Woman 1984 but at the same time you look at a lot of the criticisms and they come from the fact that his character ultimately was very like one-dimensional like he was literally like one of those MCU villains of the week kind of villains like that yeah. you see in a movie and then you forget he existed like three movies later until you go back and watch it again, you're like, oh, he was in this? And and I think what we're going to get here, hopefully, if you go by what James going to said on his social media, and then, of course, what we're getting from the Deadline article, is we're, we're going to get something that's a little more nuanced, like you referenced. We're going to get a character that's perhaps going to have an ongoing arc in, in this universe, and he's going to stick around for more than one appearance. Mm -hmm. And Sean Gunn, of course is already voicing Diesel and I believe one other character in the Creature Commandos animated show. But I think both of the characters he's voicing are, if you bring them into the live action universe, because all of this is connected, they would be like all CGI. So Sean Gunn so far, even though he's technically playing two other characters in the DCU, both of those characters, he wouldn't physically like, add, Sean Gunn the actor would be on screen. But mm -hmm. playing Maxwell Lord, he would be on screen. So I'm finally glad to see that, you know, he even though he's really good at playing, like he he, he did all the on-set body capture for, for uh, Rocket for all the Guardian mm -hmm. movies. And then, of course, uh, Bradley Cooper voices the character. But, you know, we don't usually have, we haven't really seen him, like, mm -hmm. play a role like this where he can really dig into his, you know, acting chops and give us something more nuanced than Craglin, for example, which which is yeah. the character he plays in Guardians. So I'm excited to see him take on the role. But you you wanted to go over a little bit of of like the fan reaction, and I know some fans were less excited than others. Let's say for for the from the news. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say less enthused. I just thought some of the comments were kind of funny. Can you read them? Yeah. So there was one comment on Twitter where it was like, "I'd complain about nepotism." But I kind of love Sean, LOL, which I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. Facts. Like, I don't, yeah. it, you can call it nepotism, but I quite frankly don't care because Sean Gunn, every time he's on screen, he's just like a joy to see. And there were a few I other comments like that. my favorite one is James Gunn promotes the hell out of nepotism, <laughs> LMFAO. And I'm like, yep. he sure does. It's, but, the, but the, here's the thing though, right? Like, like you think about it. If the person who you think is the best for the job happens to be related to you i'm like i'm not gonna go That's... out of my way to get somebody who's less of a fit for the role like if it you know but that's like... if that's what's happening here 
Hmm? That's all I got to say. That's the, I have questions about whether or not he is the perfect person for the role, but that's that's we fair. See, time will tell. Exactly, but but like with a lot of casting news, we usually talk about how we don't know what they have in mind for this character. Like yeah. we don't actually know what. Here's the thing. This is not something that's like official, official. Like James Gunn posting about it on social media. He didn't post that Sean Gunn has got the role. This is like Deadline reported it because yeah. they've got they got like a well sourced um, uh, inside scoop about it, but it's not officially confirmed. Like for example. Uh, you know, Nicholas Holt got cast as Lex Luthor, right? So mm -hmm. that story broke a few weeks ago and we talked about it on DC Daily and we like covered it in detail, right? But it wasn't until like a few days ago or like a week or so ago, depending on when you're watching this, that James Gunn went on threads and posted an official photo of him with Nicholas Holt in, in his office saying, hey, now it's official. And he explained that, hey, look, I know it's been in the news of late, so it may sound like I'm being repetitive here, but... It's not something that was official official until recently when, you yeah. know, all the the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. Like, I'm sure the contracts and everything that has to happen. And only then did James Gunn post about it. So James Gunn has not posted about the Sean Gunn news yet. Yeah. So as far as official, you know, casting for any project goes, we don't know what project Sean Gunn is going to show up in as Maxwell Lord. Could it be Superman Legacy? Possibly. That's the one mm -hmm. project that's live action project in the new DC that's farthest along development, but it could very easily be anything else. It could be one of the TV shows, whether it's Peacemaker season two, the Waller show, it could be the Green Lantern series. It mm, could yeah. be the Batman movie or or the Booster Gold TV show. There's so many projects coming up. I have a feeling we're probably going to get to see a little bit of him in, in Superman Legacy as like a background character. Yeah. And then he will make a larger appearance and a more significant role down the road. Of course, in the comic panel, that James Gunn shared. Let me just quickly show that on can on screen again. That panel, like very specifically, has Booster Gold in it. So when you look at that, and you look at the fact that there's a Booster Gold TV show coming up, I know that we got the previous version of Maxwell Lord in live action, but in a Wonder Woman movie, we could, you know, because he's associated with the Justice League, uh, especially Justice League International. Depending on who's in the Justice League in the new DCU. Mm -hmm. And since we're gonna get a Booster Bolt goal show, we could very easily see Maxwell Lord be like maybe an antagonist as per James Gunn in that Booster Gold TV show. So I would love to see that, you know, I think that yeah. would be great. Whichever wherever we get to see Sean Gunn again, I am a fan of his his work. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, what, and I'm, I'm sure you are too. Although you're doubting like whether he's a good fit for it, but we'll see in due time, I guess, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but guys, let us know in the comments below, what do you think about this? Do you, do you like the idea of Sean Gunn taking on the role of Maxwell Lord? Which, look, for a lot of people, it may be a bit of a downgrade going from Pedro Pascal to Sean Gunn. And I get that, but this is a new universe. We're going to get a new iteration. This Maxwell Lord may not even interact with the Wonder Woman of the universe, um, but let us know in the comments what you think about the news that Sean Gunn is going to be playing Maxwell Lord in the new DCU. Are you like the one pointing fingers for nepotism at James Gunn? Or are you, you know, just excited to see, you know, in what capacity we get to see Sean Gunn in this new universe? Let us know in the comments. And of course, keep coming back here for more content like this on DCU Daily. We, let's talk about the MCU. So the MCU, of course, recently has been struggling. And, you know, whether that's, you know, She-Hulk, whether that's Moon Knight, there's a lot of Disney Plus shows that have sort of been hit or miss, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, there even their movies have been hit or miss. Like you look at, you look at movies like, I would say, Eternals was not very good. Then when you look at other movies, even I think Wakanda Forever was not all that very good. However, it made like a ton of money. Like, I forget the exact amount. And I know it didn't make as much as Black, the first Black Panther movie did. But Wakanda Forever made mm -hmm. a good deal. It certainly made, I think it was like in the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 range, which, which was almost a billion dollars. So, Angelina, I wanted to ask you, recently we got the news that Marvel is now going to be making an animated show based on Black Panther uh, and mm -hmm. Wakanda called Eyes of Wakanda. This show is going to be coming out at some point in 2024. We don't quite have a release date for it. 
But in 2024, we are also getting two other animated Marvel shows. One of those is the, the new Spider-Man show, which is going to be sort of a prequel to the movies that we got with Tom Holland. It's like where, you know, before he meets Tony Stark. And uh, we're also getting the X-Men 97 show, which is sort of a continuation of the original X-Men animated TV series. So other than those two TV series, now we're getting a third animated show. And this is Eyes of Wakanda. And this news came out at an event where they were uh, premiering What If, which is the se second season of What If. Uh, mm -hmm. The first season was great. The second season, the trailer looks good. I haven't seen the show yet. But what is your level of interest in Eyes of Wakanda? What do you think about the idea of uh, them taking it in this direction? Because we don't know if there's going to be a third Black Panther live action movie. And there was speculation about a live action TV series. But so far, the only thing that's been announced is, of course, this animated show. I will be so honest with you. I feel like moving towards the animated shows is almost a little bit of a cop out in a way, like because they don't know where they're going currently. And although we did see a lot of like deals being made every single day, obviously the strike held up a lot of casting deals, writing, etc. It just feels like animated shows releasing three animated shows and and then having no live action films slated for 2024 currently at all right i don't think there's anything there's deadpool. everything got deadpool moved. 3 is the only one that's right. coming out yeah. so deadpool 3 is everything else got moved because of uh, one reason or another it just kind of feels like they're pivoting to buy time if that makes sense and, and to be super honest i don't love animated series like i don't generally watch them that's where you lose me because that that enters like I'm not going to use that word because y'all will come for me but it just is a little too far into the Marvel universe for me to enter I'm more of the I enjoy watching Marvel movies you will not see me like deep diving into comic books you know what I mean there's a hard line right there and I feel like animated series fall on the other side of that line that I walk and so I just don't generally watch them. And I feel like they're kind of missing out on a lot of viewership by only having animated series come out next year, you know? Yeah, and, and there was speculation. So I pulled up this article and let me put it on screen. It, it, it was speculating a little bit about, you know, plans for a live action TV show based on, on you know, the Wakanda min, you know, part of the world yeah. in the MCU. Basically, while they were working on um, Wakanda Forever, um, Nate Moore, who's one of the pro big producers over at Marvel Studios, um, he talked about the fact that Rand Coogler was just so busy with making Wakanda Forever and working on, I think they announced a spinoff um, Ironheart TV show, I believe. So mm -hmm. like all of that stuff, I think Ironheart, the TV show, it hasn't come out yet. You know, we've only gotten Wakanda Forever. But, you know, I think the, they were kind of producing them almost back to back. So Ryan Coogler was so busy with those two projects that it really was holding up any kind of talk or development on a mm -hmm. potential live action, you know, Wakanda series or Black Panther 3 instead of a movie, make it a TV show, maybe a mini series. And and then this comic book article that I put up on screen and even in the in I looked at uh, there was an article in the direct that kind of went into this a little bit as well we don't know like where they want to take the story we don't know how connected the eyes of wakanda truly is going to be to like the events of the movies or whether it's going to be something that's a prequel or it's it's, it's completely det detached it. although every animated thing they've done so far you know all, with marvel studios being like the one behind it it is connected to the mcu so like mm -hmm. even what if apparently is part of the multiverse of the MCU. So I'd imagine that whatever they decide to do here, it's going to be canon in some way to the MCU. And now as to whether it's going to directly, you know, move the story forward from what we saw, I don't know if that's what we're going to see. Like, yeah. you know, but I personally agree with you that I like the idea of a live action TV show or movie a lot better than an animated show because I don't naturally... Yeah. I mean, I feel like it loses a lot of viewership. We should look at the numbers of like previous live action movies, films, et cetera. Obviously, when we were younger, it was different, right? Like 
I used to watch Pokemon. I used to watch, I mean, I watched all of the Transformers cartoons. I loved them. I watched the Justice League cartoons. I loved them, but I feel like they're generally always geared towards super, like, super fans or children. And they lose out of a lot of viewership as we get older. Like, I would choose watching a live-action movie any day versus watching a cartoon. Although I do have, no, no, I there... do have a friend that every morning turns on the Looney Tunes every Saturday. It's, like, her thing. The... But There are exceptions, though, right? Like, yeah. it depends on what kind of thing it is. Like, if you grew up watching something, you're still going to go watch it and enjoy it because it holds a special place in your heart. Yeah. But you're right that, like, if you're watching it for the first time today, you're not going to have the same level of connection with it. Like, yeah. I think, for example, X-Men 97 is going to rely on the people who grew up watching the original X-Men animated show and this being a continuation of that, hence the name X-Men 97. They're wholly relying on the nostalgia part of it. Whereas I think with Eyes of Wakanda, you're relying on people being a fan of the two movies. So I, I really hope, because they haven't announced any casting, we have no idea what the show is going to be about, actually. But I hope that in some way, it's, it's not like an isolated story, that it does continue what we saw in the movies. Because if you're going to attract an audience here, you're going to want it to be directly connected and consequential to the larger MCU story relating to Wakanda. And especially because now we're about to get Fantastic Four and there's rumors that Doctor Doom might be getting introduced soon. So, of course, you know, Latveria and Wakanda have an interesting history mm. in the comics and Black Panther has crossed over with Doctor Doom and vice versa. So maybe they could, so I'm not saying introduce Doctor Doom in animated form first. No, bring him in a live action movie, Yeah, maybe an Avengers movie, but... I would love to see them explore some more of those connections that Wakanda has to the larger, you know, Marvel universe in the comics that we haven't so far seen in, you know, the live action MCU. So hopefully that, that will happen. And I, for one, like, like, I think like you as well, I would love to see what they do with, I, I hope they still have it in development, the live action series. Mm -hmm. And especially because, I think Wakanda Forever showed that while, yes, a lot of people will go out and watch a Black Panther movie, I I am of the belief that that movie was not as good as the first Black Panther mm -hmm. film, which was truly yeah. magical. And I think as uh, while it was reviewed really well and received very well, I think Wakanda Forever was largely like, like a tribute to Chadwick it Boseman. It was, yeah, 100%. And the so, whole... The whole premise of the whole movie was just honoring his existence. But then also anything without Chadwick Boseman is going to just be like almost non-comparable. You know what I mean? Like he was yeah, such and a force and he was so incredible on screen. So so that begs the question, right? Like, like how financially viable would a third, you know, uh, Black Panther movie be? Are you, Although, you might well, be safer forever, they, making it a TV they show. a lot of money, but it's just like, yeah, I mean, realistically, what would they do? They would they would follow the younger sisters. Well, Ooh. she's she's Black Panther now. Like Shuri yeah. is, right? Although we do find out, okay, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Wakanda Forever yet, at the end of the movie you find out that T'Challa had a had a son and Nakia's raising her, her, her yeah. their son. So maybe we'll see see that. Um and for all we know that might be part of what we've seen you know, eyes of Wakanda. So I'm interested in seeing where this show goes, but I'm even not going to lie. I'm going to be more interested in seeing where a potential live action TV show yeah. goes. Cause when I first saw this news, I was like, what live action Wakanda show, bring it on. And then yeah. I saw this animated. And I'm like, like I literally felt deflated. So, and you know, for all we know, it's going to be great. And hopefully it is, but yeah. I'm personally going to be looking forward to more of the live action stuff from the mcu that's really i think where both of our interests lie so guys let us know in the comments below what you think is this something that you're looking forward to do you want to see eyes of wakanda or are you looking forward to more more of a black panther 3 or a live action uh, black panther tv show okay so this week we have getting a new iteration of waka it's uh, the third iteration in live action so mm -hmm. 
course, we have in the past gotten the Gene Wilder Wonka. We have got the Johnny Depp Wonka, which I personally prefer. Um, and now we're, we're getting a Timothy Chalamet Wonka. So this is a movie that's meant to sort of act like a prequel to all the other movies. And <clears throat> I read somewhere that apparently this is a spiritual prequel to both Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. S spiritual meaning that, you know, it's just for fan headcanon. It's not really yeah. officially a prequel. It, in fact, Timothy Chalamet recently mentioned that he'd be open to coming back for a sequel to this movie. And Angelina, did you watch the trailers for this? Because there's quite a few peculiar things about it. Of course, I love the fact that Rowan Atkinson's in this and he's, mm -hmm. you know, one of my favorite British actors of all time. So mm -hmm. I would take however much of the movie he's in, you know, I'm going to go enjoy that part. But what are you looking forward to this? What part of the trailers have, you know, most you, intrigued you? You know, I, yes and no. I always get a little like, because I grew up watching the Gene Wilder one. Remember, like we, they showed it to us on days that the teacher d didn't want to teach. They would just turn on Willy Wonka and the Chocolate, it's a chocolate Factory. And I, I grew up, you know, reading the Roald Dahl book. And anytime there's a new iteration of Willy Wonka, I just feel very, like, suspicious until I've seen it. And do I think that Timothy Chalamet is the, the, the best pick to play such a peculiarly magical fantastical character no I do not and I feel like the trailer I don't know like I'm intrigued but I'm not intrigued does that make sense like I'm kind of like I'm gonna go see it but I feel like I already know that I'm not gonna really love it uh, but oh, so far it has like decent ratings by critics. Uh, we're at 84%. So it's certified fresh currently. However, some of the top critic reviews, like top critics are giving it like a 1.5 out of 4, a 3 out of 4. The highest I think I saw was 3 out of 4 from the critics. Yeah, there's definitely some critics who don't like it so far. I mean, the number of reviews on this, when we were doing the show, it's got like 148 reviews. That number is definitely going to go up probably well past 200. And when you have that many reviews added up, usually the number goes down because and not by much, yeah. but I mean, I think a hundred plus reviews already, it's safe to say, you know, and that's why they have a certified fresh, you know, rating on it because it's likely not going to slide all that much. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the critics like it. We don't have an audience score yet because this hasn't been released in North America yet. I will point this out though. I was looking at this on deadline. This movie already got released in a bunch of markets internationally. In fact, we covered it on the Dan show recently and, you know, Mags went and saw it and she, she liked it. I mean, I was like, um, I was a little surprised by some of her comments because there's some elements that she talked about that she liked, which I think the way she described them, I was like, if I went and saw this movie, I probably would not like the way they approached mm -hmm. that. But then again, you know, art hits everybody differently. Having yeah. said that, this movie has already started off to a, you know, pretty decent run at the box office internationally it's, it's already got over 30 million dollars and like i said it's pretty some big markets like across europe and asia and south america and now we have, we've got some predictions for what it's going to do in its opening weekend domestically mm -hmm. in north america and it's looking like it's going to kick off with roughly 75 million yeah. which is a good number yeah. like i'm not saying this is going to make a billion dollars but avatar the first avatar and and uh, even Aquaman, the first Aquaman, both movies made you know over a billion. Of course, Avatar is the highest grossing movie of all time. Then both of those movies were released around this time in, in the Christmas uh, time of year, and they both started with roughly seventy million. So that tends to be you know a good marker in terms of if you've Longevity, got how a good do. word of mouth, critics reviews and everything, you will have the runway you know in yeah. well into January where not a lot of movies are coming out. To keep making money and so 75 million domestic it's looking like by the end of this opening weekend in the u.s and canada this movie is going to have made you know over 120 million which is, is you know a good chunk of his budget so financially this movie is going to do well it looks like it's not i mean unless you know audiences really hate it and then it just craters which look the one thing about wonka like forget the critics reviews 
this franchise, people have some very strong opinions about the previous two entries, whether they go swing in one way or the other or have, you know, or, or they love both. So there's clearly going to be comparisons made. And now, of course, this movie, um, spoiler alert, Max told me this movie basically ends at a certain point where it's ready to go right into the events of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the book mm. by Roald Dahl. So it's very much a proper prequel that kind of sets you up for the events of the book. So I'm sure that Warner Brothers is looking at this and saying, maybe we're going to, you know, do a really a new Willy yeah. Wonka and the Chocolate Factory or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Timothy Chalamet. But it will depend entirely on how audiences receive it. And I think that's where it, the, the key lies. Like, like yeah. what do you think so far about Timothy Chalamet in this role? Like, do you think he can... He's I mean, certainly got big shoes to fill. Uh, yeah, and that's the biggest thing is that I just, I don't necessarily know that he is the right choice. And I'm not going to really know until I see the movie. I feel like he's always played, I don't know, even in Dune, like his characters are fairly 2D. I feel like Willy Wonka, if you were to quantify him, is so fantastical and so magical and so otherworldly in so many ways that it is a big it is a big shoe to fill right so I I just don't know if Timothy Chalamet has that in him but we're gonna see we're gonna go see the movie and we're gonna figure it out it's the perfect time of the year to release this movie too so there's that it's gonna be a good family movie that that is definitely true because for Warner Brothers, and this is something that that Deadline article was pointing out, they've got three movies on the schedule right now, and most other studios don't have a ton at all. Like Disney put, took a bunch of movies off the schedule, Universal, like, and there's a I'm not saying there's no other movies coming out. There are, but none of them are like the big, you know, four quadrant movies as the term goes um, that you would associate with you know box office successes. So we're gonna have Wonka. Then we're going to have Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And then we're going to have The Color Purple. And Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom and The Color Purple are coming on out on two sides of the same weekend, literally around Christmas. I think one comes, af one comes out on Christmas Day, which is, I believe, The Color Purple. And then Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom comes out on the Friday preceding Christmas. So you could literally watch one of those at the start of your weekend and the other on, the other, on, the, uh, on Christmas Day. And then Wonka will still be around. All three are Warner Brothers movies. So I think the biggest thing for Warner Brothers right now for, for you know, like David Zaslav and, 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 and company, they, they've, you know, got the runway here to make all the money because as a studio, Warner Brothers has had a rough year. Yeah. Just, just going by the DC movies alone, they've had Shazam, The Flash, and Blue Beetle all flop. And so far, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is not tracking to do nearly as well as the first one did, which made a billion dollars. So... Uh, yeah, they're probably hoping and, and dune part two which was probably going to be their highest grossing movie of the year as a yeah. studio got moved to 2024 so as a studio they really need this win and and i think wonka probably has the highest potential to deliver mm -hmm. based on the projections already and the reviews we're seeing and then hopefully the audience reaction is similar to what the critics are saying which is by and large positive so i'm looking forward to seeing what this movie actually looks like i have you know, seeing what Max thinks about it. Of course, between you and I, the trailers, I think the trailers have been like up and down. Like I don't quite buy Timothy Chalamet per personally as Wonka. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that Bo Jean Wilder and uh, Johnny Depp are, were more charismatic and, and better fits for like the eclectic character that Billy Wonka is in, in the Roald Dahl book. But then again, this is a prequel, so maybe they're playing it as like, this is not quite the Wonka that we know, and he's going to get there. Uh, he has to kind of become a little bit jaded and, you know, then a little crazy. So, uh, you know, not having seen the movie, I don't know. Maybe that's where this is going to go. And by yeah. the end of the movie, if, if you go by, like, again, what Max told me, like, this movie is going to leave us in a spot where it can naturally flow into a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate or a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie. Yeah. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let's let's see how it looks. Um I want to see what the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes looks like. 
Um, but yeah, uh, we'll go see the movie. We'll come back. We'll talk about it. So guys, definitely, you know, come back here and uh, check out that review. Of course, if you have uh, already seen the movie or if, if you can't wait for our review this weekend, we'll have uh, the review that I did with Max uh, up on the channel as well under the Dan Show playlist. And you can also see our review here. And uh, I'll, I haven't seen the movie myself, but I'd love to tell you guys what I thought about it. So to come back and check that out. Of course, if you're interested in hearing what I have to say. <laughs> so let us know in the comments below what you think about Wonka. Are you looking forward to it? Uh, and uh, do come back here for the review when we have it up. Angelina, it's been great talking to you. Um, and it's, I know it's been a, a rough a few days. <laughs> so I hope I hope you're feeling better next week. And uh, I hope your cat makes another a guest appearance. Uh, that was very entertaining. So uh, very distracting, but very entertaining. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll we'll talk to you guys next time. Go out there and uh, have a wonderful week. Go watch a movie, and then you know, for the love of movies, come back here and join us at Osa Curious, and we'll review and comment and like and subscribe and do all of that fun stuff here on the next show.